this is a, is a great time. I'm really uh, you know, enthusiastic to be here. I love giving talks. Every time somebody asks me to give a talk, I almost always say yes. It's really important as a scientist to get out there and tell people about the good stuff that we're doing, right? And that's the whole point of Earth Day. It's the 47th Earth Day, the March for Science, obviously, and the Earth Optimism Summit, why we're all here. Now, given that, when they if, you know, officially asked me to do this, I was a little bit hesitant at first. I mean, I'm a scientist. I'm used to thinking about all the things that are wrong with the Earth, right? There's almost no place on Earth that's untouched by man. We farm the desert, right? We farm the desert to get food to feed all the people that we have. Carbon dioxide concentrations are up 40%. 80% of fisheries are overexploited. These are all things probably everybody knows. Our iconic North American herbivore, the bison, the buffalo, is largely extirpated from its, most of its range. It's almost 100% decline since the 1800s. This is a huge pile of buffalo skulls waiting to be ground into fertilizer, of all things. Right? I mean, how sad is that? So this is a map of global forest cover. This comes in a little bit where I'm going to talk about today. The green areas are existing forest cover. The red is deforestation since the colonial times. Most of the world was covered in forests. We wiped out a large portion of it. The little bit of white that you see at the end, that's reforestation. That's gain. And that's a little bit about what I'm going to be talking about today. So biodiversity is declining. What can we do about it? I'm a scientist. I'm also a citizen. What can we do about it from our little tiny patch of the woods? Well. What I'm going to talk about today is an experiment that we, we, we took under uh, we, we started about four years ago at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center, which I'm going to show you in a second. It's all those fields that you can see right there. From an ecological perspective, this is a really large experiment. It's about 60 acres in size. It's about 20,000 trees. If you had to walk up to each and every tree to take a measurement, it's literally a marathon. So it's a big experiment. It's really tough to do. We designed it to last for 100 years because trees last a long time, right? They're long lived. Now, I'm an academic, so I have to publish papers, get grants, train graduate students, and when I tell people that this is what I'm doing now, I'm taking on this large sort of demonstration project, this is the response that I often get, right? Why are you doing this? This is, this is kind of a crazy endeavor, so what are you doing this for? And it is important to ask yourself, why do we need these large-scale, long-term biodiversity experiments? There are easier ways to reforest an area, right? This is a typical forest plantation, it's a monoculture. There's actually a lot of these around the world, about 300 million hectares, or 7% of the world's uh, forest area. We're getting about 3 million new hectares of this kind of forest every single year because they're really important for industry. And there are basically about five different species. Most of the world comprise these single culture, uh, single species monocultures. Now, I'm a, an ecologist. I'm a community ecologist. And so I think that variety is the spice of life, right? All this diversity here on the right-hand side of this panel, these multiple species assemblages, we know from lots of different experiments that when you have multiple species around, they take up resources more efficiently, they utilize things better, and that system as a whole functions a little bit better than that monoculture over on the left. The other thing that's going on there, like let's just say a pest comes along, wipes out one of the species, you've got a bunch left to take up the slack. So biodiversity is good. This is the, the prevailing uh, sort of conventional wisdom. We know this from lots of different, relatively small-scale experiments, things like lab uh, beakers on a bench, mesocosm experiments, and I'm not just picking on all of these. This is an example from my own research over on the left in shallow water seagrass beds, but basically small-scale experiments. This is at a slightly larger scale. This is the Cedar Creek Biodiversity Experiments, very famous set of experiments in Minnesota. These are grassland ecosystem experiments. Each one of those is a 10 by 10 meter plot, I think the size is. And what they've done in there is they've manipulated grassland plant diversity you know, from one to up to 20 or 30 species and measured some ecosystem function. And often, almost always you see a positive relationship between diversity and ecosystem function. But as a newly converted sort of terrestrial ecologist working on forests, you know, forests are kind of where it's at. It's about 80% of the world's terrestrial biodiversity is tied up in forests. This is a very famous terrestrial ecosystem, a long-term study site for the Smithsonian Barrow, Colorado, Colorado Island in Panama. And essentially what people have studied there for a long time is how that forest template scales up to influence both the tree diversity, productivity, and all the things that utilize that forest, all the little insects and critters that live in there. Now, I actually learned a couple of things putting together this talk that I wanted to share with you because I think it's really neat. So there's been a recent count. There's about three trillion trees on the earth. That's an enormous number. Until you consider that we're losing 10 billion trees a year to deforestation, right? The second thing is, there's about 60,000 tree species on the Earth. Again, a huge number. 
but one in six of every tree species is threatened with extinction. And for most of these species, the vast majority, we know virtually nothing about what they're doing in ecosystems. We know very little about their ecology and how that might scale up to influence the whole ecosystem in which they live. So we need these tree diversity experiments, but trees are big and they live a long time. And it's hard to do these kinds of experiments and not many people have done them before. Now, from a philosophical perspective, that doesn't mean we shouldn't do them. This is an old saying I really like, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago, the second best time is now. So that's one way to think about this. You know, if not now, when, just go ahead and do it. But it doesn't solve sort of my practical problem as a scientist and how do you get papers and what's the sort of the, the rationale for doing these kinds of experiments. This is a little bit of a shout out for the Smithsonian here. You know, I, I'm lucky enough to work at a great institution like this. We're well known as a set of museums on the, on the mall. Right we have lots of natural history collections, cultural artifacts. We do a lot and we they really sort of encourage a long-term broad scale perspective on the world around us. Now, what most people don't recognize, I was actually talking to someone earlier today about this, is we have a bunch of research centers around the world. And what I want to do now is orient you to where I work. It's only about 25 miles from here. This is uh, Smithsonian Environmental Research Center. So here we are in DC. Now we're zooming over the landscape. We're passing from an urban to a rural gradient. This is a 3,000 acre wooded campus on the shores of the Chesapeake Bay. That was a big research lab. Here's my site. Here's my field site right there. As we zoom in, you're actually going to be able to see my trees and the experiments there. So what we've done is we've taken a single watershed. There's all the little trees. Now we're passing down a little stream that cuts through the middle. It's an entire encapsulated watershed that's been studied continuously for 30 years. And that watershed dumps into the Road River, which itself dumps into the Chesapeake Bay. So one of the ways I like to think about this experiment, if we get nothing out of it, at the very least, we've taken this, this farming agricultural system converted it back to a native forest and helped out with the sort of the nutrient diet that the Chesapeake Bay needs. Okay, this is too big of an experiment to do by yourself. We've had lots of help doing this. I have a real public outreach component in my, in my lab, which we were talking about earlier. I've used about 200 different citizen scientists, everything from families and homeschool uh, people to graduate students um, have, have been out there to help us out. And in fact, one of the interns is, is here today. Um, what are we measuring? So what are the, the different things that we're measuring out there? Well, the first thing is tree survival and growth. If you, trees don't survive and don't grow, you don't have a forest. Um, so this is it when we planted it. This is 2013. Again, it was just a few years ago now. Those little tiny green things that you see in the middle spot there, those are sycamore trees. Everything that we planted was a one-year-old bare root seedling when we planted it. Take a look at that. There's a tower. It's a, getting lost a little bit in the sunlight there in the background, but there's a, there's a little radio tower in the background that you might be able to see for reference on this next slide. Uh, here those trees are in 2015. So I'm standing in that same spot. Those sycamore trees are now 30 feet tall. That actually little mini patch of sycamores is starting to act like a mini forest, which is what we're aiming for, right? This is a, a way of studying different species both in isolation and in combination. And off to the back of my left, you can see a little bit of green there. Those trees haven't really grown very much, but that's sort of the nature of the business. Different species do different things. Okay, this is a map showing what's happening over time with mortality. Each time you see a dot and it disappears, that tree died. But I want you to focus on up in the top right there, that little blue patch that nothing changes. That's that sycamore plot I was standing in earlier. Only one of those trees died over the entire time we were there. But if you look a, a few patches over to the left, there's a little purple square where almost everything dies over time. That's one of our poorly performing hickory patches. That's sort of what happens. You have species-specific mortality. But I want to show you now the, the effects of the diversity level. So I was told not to show any graphs. Don't be such a scientist, but old habits die hard. So I will show one graph. This is sort of your homework to, to do this. OK, on the left-hand side, this is the number of surviving trees after three years. We started at 255, so any decrease from that line is mortality. And it's either in the one species treatment, so you have 255 trees and they're all the same species, a four species mixture or a 12 species mixture. Okay, look across those lines across the middle there. It's basically the same thing. We've got about 78% survival across the whole experiment, which is actually not bad in terms of a tree restoration experiment, by the way. Um, but it doesn't differ from 1 to 4 to 12, right? So biodiversity is not increasing the survival overall, which, you know, okay, that's fine. But look at the variability. Those little black dots, those are the spread around the mean. So those are the individual plots. At the single species level, some do really well, and some basically don't. But that variability decreases as you go to four, and it gets even smaller if you go up to 12. So in fact, there's 62% less variability in the 12 species versus the single species polyculture. 
This is the, the portfolio effect of biodiversity. This is analogous to buying a mutual fund versus a stock. Right? You buy a mutual fund, your average performance is going to stay pretty high, but you, you minimize your risk of picking a really poorly performing stock or species in this case. Right? You may miss out on the best performing stock, but at least you don't have complete planting failure. So the point here in the bottom is that biodiversity is risk management. This is why we protect biodiversity in our ecosystems. So if you lose one species, there are others left around to pick up the slack. And this is experimental evidence from only three years in a tree experiment. Okay, we're measuring a bunch of different things. I'm going to run through these really quickly in the interest of time here. Um, I have a postdoc. She's a Smithson fellow. She's sitting way in the back. Karen Burkhart, she's looking at insect diversity. This is important because you know, the forest is more than just the trees, right? We're really interested in how this stuff scales up to influence everything that depends on the forest. Insects are really important because they form the base of the food web that, that goes up and it becomes mammals and birds and everything else. And what she's found after uh, just one year is that if you look at a tree and you look at the insects on it in a polyculture versus a monoculture, you get 40% more insects and more diverse groups of insects in a mixture. So in this case, the effects of biodiversity do ripple up through the food web and have positive impacts on everything else. Okay, we're looking at a bunch of different things. One of the things you always have to worry about when you plant a forest, if you plant a, a tree or anything in your backyard, a white-tailed deer, yes, they're native parts of the ecosystem, but they're wildly overabundant, and so we're interested in how different species respond to that. We're looking at lots of different below-ground stuff, um, below-ground carbon storage, nutrient dynamics, microbial activity. The idea here is that different species do different things, and when you combine them, you're going to get more functions in a multi-species assemblage than a single-species assemblage. We're part of a larger global network called TreeDivNet. It's about 25 experiments in six continents. The earliest one started, or the oldest one in 1999. It's not very long in terms of a tree growth, but it's not bad. We've actually planted over a million trees in this effort so far, 230 different tree species. So we're pretty proud of that until we saw that India has recently planted 50 million trees in a single day. <laughs> so everybody's getting into the tree planting business, including the queen mum. This is a really important effort to do. What I hope that we can do as scientists then is we can bring a little bit of scientific perspective to this. If the goal is to protect biodiversity, to minimize your risk, and to provide multiple ecosystem functions, we should really be planting these multi-species assemblages, not the single species assemblage. And I want to leave you with one final um, slide here. This is sort of why I'm doing all of this. Yes, I planned an experiment that will probably outlive me, and that's basically a good thing. Um, because first of all, it's just going to sit there soaking up nutrients, soaking up carbon. Trees are a tried and true source of carbon capture technology. And at the end of the day, though, what we're really hoping to get here is provide science-based solutions for the grand challenges that we face. So thank you, everybody, for coming, and keep it up. <laughs>